Now we're continuing our readings in Psalms and once again a, uh, a piece which is to be sung. I sometimes think we're really limited in our language because it's rhyming in Hebrew, which I don't speak by the way, but it's rhyming and has rhythm and flow that's very, very hard to replicate in English. And if you try to envisage it as a song, it's quite difficult to do so. From the director of music, it's Psalm 44, from the director of music to the sons of Korah, a masculine, a song. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what you did in their days. In the days long ago, when your hands drove out the nations and planted our people, you crushed the peoples and made our fathers flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring victory. The light of your face, it was your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you loved them. You are my king and my God, who decrees victories for Jacob. Though we push back our enemies, though your na through your name we trample our foes. I do not trust my bow. My sword does not bring me victory, but you bring victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God we make our boast all day long and will praise your name forever. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You've made us retreat before the enemy. Our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us to be devoured like sheep and scattered amongst the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You've made us a reproach to our neighbours, a scorn and derision to those around us. You have made us a byword amongst the nations. People shake their heads at us. My disgrace is before me all day long and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge. All this happened to us, though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt of jackals and covered us in the deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread our hands out to foreign gods, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of our hearts? Yet for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, O Lord, why do you sleep? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust, our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Redeem us because of your unfailing love. This is the word of God. It's quite a, a confronting, pick up the wrong thing here, uh, quite a confronting s psalm, isn't it? And um, you realise the context of that is, of course, the people of Israel. And whatever the the context is that some of the phraseology is, is ours to take on board and to embrace and to uh, um, abs absorb into ourselves. Now in this, in this series that we're, we're doing, hang on, before we get into that, um, there's a bag of pears at the front door, big bag of pears. So feel free, to, feel free to fill up your pockets with pears. Pockets with pears, yes, okay. And um, on the way out, they're from my daughter-in-law-to-be, her, her father's farm. So, where are we? Get myself sorted here. So we're talking about lament. We're talking about this, this idea of uh, saying, God, these are my feelings. This is the reality. This is what I feel. This is hard. This is difficult. And being really honest about that. And um, let's just do a quick recap on what we uh, covered uh, last week in this series. Firstly, we said that the, the title uh, is Morning After Series, and we said it's okay to feel. It is okay to feel stuff. This, 
And a little subtitle to that, but we, we're kind of not getting quite there yet, but it is, the story is not over yet. It's okay to feel. It's okay to be real, to walk in the light, to uh, say this is where I'm at at the moment, and to not have it all together. The problem with uh, human nature is that we are social creatures and we want to conform to one another. And if we have an expectation of the uh, dominant culture in a place, we, we naturally conform to one another. You are all sitting down as I talk. You are all conformists, right? This is what we do. And sometimes the culture of a place can be, uh, you know, and I keep your feelings squeezed, pressed down into a tight ball right in the pit of your stomach until you develop a stomach ulcer, right? What the English do best, I said last week, right? That sort of sense of repression. Okay. And we talked about uh, the, this phrase, it's not your fault, which a lot of counselors uh, use, and they say, look, it's not... It, it, sometimes we are uh, promoters of our own issues. You know, we, we, we have some responsibility for them. But an awful lot of times, it's things that are done to us, it's the circumstances of life, the brokenness, the suffering of, 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 our, of this world that creates in us uh, such things. Now, as we heard, heard in that uh, uh, psalm that we just read, it was a prayer with a lot of the words, we have failed, or we haven't failed, or we, we feel like you've let us down, God. This is a corporate prayer. This is a, a big issue when it comes to reading Scripture that we don't read them in the plural. We tend to only read them through the individual I, me, and, me and God kind of stuff. And it's really important that if we're to grasp some of, the, some of the texts that are laments in the Bible, that it's more than just the privacy or, or the, uh, the individual. It's, it's about us together. And we talked a little bit about that last week. So we said our, our faith has to be personal. We have to be able to say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. He's my number one. Um, I'm looking to serve him, to walk with him, to be a disciple. Is it private? No, it's not, actually. It's not a private thing. That's what the culture says to it. You keep your spirituality private. Yeah, no, I kind of can't, can't do that. Um, as long as I'm not forcing it on people and being aggressive about it, but... Yeah, this is very real to me. This is part of my identity. Um, is it individual? Yes, absolutely. But it's also, as I say, this idea of a corporate thing. So why, why should we be honest? We said last week because Scripture commands us, encourages us, however you want to phrase it. But even more importantly, because if we walk in the light, we begin to experience the healing, the blessing, the love of God uh, and j others who journey with us. And so we said, uh, let's cooperate without denying or hiding our woundedness under a veneer of hallelujahs. Sometimes, was it, was it Doskoyevsky, I think, said, uh, my hallelujahs, I can't quite remember the quote exactly, my hallelujahs are sometimes born, my hosannas are sometimes born in a furnace of doubt. I can really identify with that sometimes. Okay, and we talked about a whole bunch of issues go that might be going on. In church life. That was a very quick recap. If you want to find out more and you weren't here or didn't, weren't able to see it, um, you can go online. Okay, this week, um, I just thought I'd, if, if, if issues are, are brought up for you <laughs> w going through this series, then I'm very happy to chat with you. And I know Bronco would and, and others would as well. Um, uh, and I kind of hope issues will be brought up for you um, because this is about saying to God, okay, this is the stuff I'm really dealing with. So, quick um, thing about pastor warranty. It has come to our attention that the pastor you received was shipped with a slight defect. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not psychic. Because of this, you must observe certain procedures to ensure optimum performance. It is necessary to inform them of any members who are hospitalized. If someone you know is in need of prayer, the pastor must be told, or they won't know. If you are in need of a pastoral visit, you will get the best results if you ask for one. We regret any inconvenience this may cause. Okay, and one more cartoon, okay? Permission to whinge, this is kind of what we're saying today. Why study the book of Numbers? 36 chapters of self-centered people who whined every time they didn't get their way. Give us something relevant. <laughs> yeah, okay. So whining, permission to whine. Uh, these few weeks are about getting permission to feel stuff and be honest about our pain, pain, our doubt, or our sin, or that which is done against us, which is a sin. These things are not the same. Doubt, 
I would say, is, is a, a necessary corollary of having faith. It's just ha- having that ability to go, ah, is that right? Is that, you know? It's, it's, it's asking the hard question. So s- suppressing doubt, then, you know, I don't have a problem, actually, if you ha- come with a bunch of doubt. I have a bunch of doubt at times. <gasps> You're the pastor. You're supposed to be absolutely certain about all things. No, I'm not. And this is a thematic overview uh, rather than uh, deeply be- getting ourselves buried in the text like we did with Luke as we went through Luke. It's a bird's eye view. So think of the Psalms of Lament in the, in the Old Testament, for example, and the Bible as a whole. It's about a third of the Psalms are Psalms of Lament. Even got a book in the Old Testament, right? What's it called? Lamentations, right? Or Habakkuk. Or a whole of Ecclesiastes, basically. Or, or Job, or even Paul in Romans 8. There is a lot of crying out and whinging in the Bible. Lots of moaning myrtles, if you know that. So what is uh, lament in, when we think of it in those terms? Well, firstly, I'd say lament is towards God. It's not sulking or going off in a half or abandoning the faith, though it may involve a dark sense of God's presence. You, you might have this sense of, I, I'm still talking to you, God, but there's a kind of gap there where you once were. But I know that it's shaped like you, so I'm, I'm going to keep talking to that thing that I feel is a massive gap. It's looking at God and, and um, to use the words of a certain prime minister, shirt fronting him. And we sometimes think prayer is all about politeness. Don't make God ma- mad. Talk nicely. Be kind. I kind of have a slightly different view. He wants us to see how serious we are, how honest we are. And sometimes we've been only taught genteel prayers with little or no honesty. It's not saying that we need to develop the, vo- the vocabulary of a, of a sailor in port. But God wants to know you're serious. But of course, we have to be prepared for him to reframe our prayers when we do that. So it's words, yes. But it's also feelings. I, I, I think of some of the passages in, in the Bible, Romans 8, the groaning, the terms of, of groaning, as in a mother in childbirth, Paul describes the groaning of the Spirit as we eagerly await the coming of the Lord. Or Hagar's son Ishmael in Genesis uh, is dying, and, and Hagar cries out in wordless agony, and God interprets her tears like a prayer. Similarly, in 1 Samuel 1, verse 10, it says, Hannah was crushed in soul and prayed to God and cried and cried and cried inconsolably. So in a sense, vocabulary is secondary. You don't need to be good at worms. (laughs) Use the Psalms. Use the Psalms. Reframe the Psalms. We're going to do that a little bit uh, uh, bit later. Okay. Dropping out. Um, like I said last week, um, Lent can even be a picture that you do do. Uh, lament, sorry, not lament. Lament. But do what you do in the presence of the one who uh, loves you. A grandfather was walking through his yard when he heard his granddaughter repeating the alphabet in a tone of voice that sounded like prayer. He asked her what she was doing. The little girl explained, I'm praying, but I can't think of exactly the right words, so I'm just saying all the letters of the alphabet, and God will put them together for me, because he knows what I'm thinking. Warm chicken soup for the soul kind of story, isn't it? So we talk about, in lament, we talk about towards God, it's also feelings, it's words, it's about trouble and sorrow, isn't it? If you think of our own story, um, you could be like Job, I hope not. You've lost everything and your body's in agony. Or David surrounded by enemies. And that's many of the Psalms have that as a background, but the, the vocabulary is, is wider than just David's specific situations. But he's running from Saul, for example. But the metaphors that he uses are, are able for all God's people through the centuries to, to use and to make personal. As I was looking through this, I was, I was saying this to Sue the other day. It's amazing when we actually 
look at some of the Psalms and we hear some of the metaphors that are used. And if you know a little bit of the background of the, the wider religions of the time, the Babylonian, the Syrians, uh, Philistines, etc., etc., you realize when you talk about roaring lions and bears and all these things, those were actually terms for the other kind of demonic deities around the place. We're in a battle. We're in a fight. So it's personal, but it's also for others. You think of Lamentations or the psalm that we read earlier, Psalm 44, Jeremiah 9. Lamenting well uh, points us towards God's heart for the future. The future will be the wholeness of all things. A time that is not yet come. And as we uh, lament, God weeps too. Or put another way, it's joining in with God's lament. It's Jesus crying over Jerusalem and going, Ah, oh, if only you had seen the moment when the Messiah was coming in to your city. It's Jesus in the garden crying out and saying, Lord, is there any other way than just agony and pain here? It's Jesus on the cross saying, My God, why have you forsaken me? Or it's even God and himself in the Old Testament asking the question, why did I make these people? And we may say to God, oh, all this brokenness in the world, what are you waiting for? But think of it another way. God feels the pain of that waiting too. And he feels it more than we do. There are clues to this in, uh, in the Bible. Jesus phrased it this way. He, said, he describes it in a couple of parables as the harvest is not yet ripe for the full incoming of the kingdom. But in the meantime, there's wheat and tares. There's weeds and, and there's as well as good stuff going on. God feels that waiting with us and feels that brokenness with us uh, I, I came across it while I was reflecting on this uh, th this verse in Revelation and the martyrs before the throne of God are saying how long O Lord before you step in and avenge our murders then each martyr was given a white robe and told to sit back and wait until the full number of martyrs the full number of martyrs was filled from among their servant companions and friends in the faith. The fullness of sacrifice in God's people has to come to fruition, it seems. The cup of suffering is not yet full, it seems. I don't know exactly what that means, if I'm honest. But it feels like God is saying part of this story is that the darker it gets, and the more you experience that darkness, the greater the they knew more. The ending will be. And suffering seems to be part of the deal. Remember those um, promises of Jesus. You know, you're going to follow me. You're going to carry a cross. In this world, you will have trouble. Right? I claim, I claim that promise, Jesus. In this world, I'm going to have trouble. Yeah, nah. And in many ways, you can make that last statement of anyone. But the difference is that in Christ, those sufferings can be transformative. Suffering is what we should expect in life. And really, in some senses, the being a Christian isn't that we get things any, any necessarily any better or easier. Sometimes, as we saw in those that verse in Revelation, it's worse. But the suffering can be transformed because of the cross of Jesus. And we hear this sometimes where, where people want to remake the Bible to be a zip up to heaven escape plan. All right? Do not pass go. Just go straight there. In fact, heaven is more about this world being transformed and us being part of that transformation. So think of, it, think of the Bible like this. The Bible starts with this really hopeful, good place. It's called the Garden of Eden, right? Just want to make sure you're still awake. You all right? Remember that place? Naked man, naked woman, everything's sweet, hunky-dory, okay? It's a good place. What does the Bible end with? It ends with a garden city coming down to earth to transform the whole of creation. It begins with one garden, but what's the problem here? 
we're not in the Garden of, Garden of Eden, and we're not at that point at the end of time when the Garden of City comes down. We're caught in between those two places. And what happens in between? We break off relationship, and the consequences for the whole of creation are massive. Thistles, weeds, sin, broken relationships, death have come into the world. And to have a kind of spirituality where we deny pain or a theology of total healing, of health and wealth and peace is a denial of reality. The kingdom is not yet fully come. Now look, don't get me wrong, I'm, I've, I've seen people get healed. I've seen massive answers to prayers at times. Give us more of that, Lord. But the reality is, even if you get healed, you will still die, right? You will still decay. I looked in the mirror this morning. I am still decaying. <laughs> Don't say amen to that. <laughs> but our call is to discover that lament and groaning um, w within the world and for the world is part of our journey through to res the resurrection day. And when we integrate our faith, lament is part of our calling as God's people. We lament, we groan within creation as part of the, the wider community when we look out into our world and we see the brokenness in our world and even just our neighbors through to Ukraine and Yemen and so on and so forth. And we do it also, this is why we have our prayer meeting on a Wednesday, also uh, for the world as part of our calling to be stewards for the world, to pray. So do join us on Wednesdays. Uh, we'd love to see even more in that Zoom meeting it's not very long it's not a big ask half an hour to pray for our world please join us when integrated into our faith lament is our calling and, and this series is a little bit workshop like and we'll get to a workshop bit in a, in a few minutes but you'll not be asked to disclose anything personal but i'd encourage you with those booklets that i'm sure you've all brought back with you this sunday uh, with you or if you didn't get one uh, hopefully there's some sheets going around and you can uh, right on the back of those. Um, just to be authentic with God, to not deny pain, to uh, ask why are things w not working out as I'd hoped, Lord. There's a, there was a Coldplay song, Coldplay, for those of you not of the right generation, uh, a pop group who sang a song, I will try to fix you. The song was called Fix You. And the bad news is that not all problems are fixable. Jacob wrestled with God in the Old Testament and always walked with a limp. He was left with a limp. We may not be healed or rescued or have our questions answered. I'll tell you what, I don't know if I've said this before. I went to Bible college 30 years ago. There's a, there's a lot of anniversaries going on in my head at the moment. To, tomorrow is the anniversary of when I chose to start following Jesus in 1977 um, but I went to Bible college uh, about 30, 30 odd years ago or a little bit more and I went with 10 really really good questions that I wanted answered when I went to Bible college and I left with about 100 really really good questions that I wanted answers for right we wrestle we lament we travel alongside with those who are broken, who aren't healed, who don't have neat answers. But what do we have? We don't have neat answers, but we do have the promise of presence. Whether or not we always feel it, we have the promise of God's presence. One of the questions of lament is this, can I say what I'm feeling without feeling judged? This is so important. Uh, as a church, are we a safe place? As individuals with, indivi with others, are we a safe place? If we're to be a mature community who welcome people who have warts and all, we must not be in a hurry getting people to where we think they should be quickly. The peace of God ought to shape us in terms of how we deal with one another, not in a rush. The pace of love, we've talked about the pace of God who is love, is a walk. 
rushing ourselves or others past the lament stage is not mature love. Now, anybody who's done any counseling or had any counseling knows that reality. Sometimes we can't hear things. Sometimes uh, the counselor just wants to allow us space to breathe and to express our stuff for quite a while. We want to fix things. I don't know about you, but any of you who, who have family members who have challenges in life. I say this as, as a father in this situation, but there's, I'm always wanting to f- fix stuff, right? Relationally. To give answers. Sue says to me, I, I, I just want to talk about feelings. My job there is to sit and to engage and to listen and to mostly do that. Problem is, I, I'm, I, I, you know, it's, I don't know if it's a man thing. I know it's a cliche to say it's a man thing, but there's a, there's a part of me that just wants to go, but what about that? What about that? And what about that? And how about if you did this? And, and No, sit. Job's friends in the Bible kept stum. Use that word, stum, right? Kept quiet for ages before they eventually cracked. That was their problem. His lament went on a few days too long for their patience. Do you know people like that? Have you ever been like that? Or you're tracking with somebody and, ah, come on, just get over this, dude. Is what you're thinking. You you might not say it that bluntly, I hope not. Um, But lament is about us as individuals, but it's also about us as a community, not in a hurry to get people across some line that we imagine will solve the problem. I still find this hard after 30 years of being a pastor. And I think that it's so true for any church fellowship in dealing with anybody that we become mature in this way. So later we're going to get into a series of messages about ways of noticing God. And that's a huge issue in our culture, which uh, sees God as uh, far, far away and, and, and out of reach. And it's important we find a counter narrative to that. Um, not simply saying, oh, the Bible says God's close kind of thing, but help people on the journey with that. Um, but park that just now. We're in the feeling stage still. Sometimes I'll be in a pastoral conversation and I talk too much. I, I, I freely admit that sometimes. But sometimes if I listen deeply and ask good questions, and while I'm doing that, I'm often in the back of my mind going, Lord, what do you want to do here? What do you want to do? Do you have something to say? What should I be here? But it requires the sacrifice, and every pastor knows this one, the sacrifice of my ego, my need to speak, my need to tell you how to fix you. That's cold place, hey? Yes, I'm a pastor. Yes, I always have an agenda, as we all do for other people at times. But love calls us just to sit with someone, to be alongside when they are lamenting and to incarnate the presence of God's Spirit and then to wait and to wait and to wait, to be a community who enables a safe place to be sad. That can be a great gift for some people. Don't get me wrong. We are approaching Easter. Jesus is alive and the kingdom of God is breaking out and growing across the world. The Lord will return and we have much to celebrate and we uh, live in a kind of, in that in-between space. As I say, we're on the one hand, we're almost schizophrenic. We're we're celebrating the future uh, even as it breaks into the present, but we're also aware of the brokenness. But we are a people of hope in that brokenness. And you can't be a people of hope without thoroughly acknowledging the sadness, the lament. Hope is birthed in in the heart of a Hebrew prophet in, in exile. In an oppressed people, in a corner of a brutal empire, in the heart of a pregnant young girl, and in a garden tomb. It's in the darkest places that the word hope is meant to be alive to us. Lament is about us as individuals, but it's also about us as a community, not in a hurry. So, we're going to do some work in a second. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. 
Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. I mean, just think of your own past and your own story. Somebody in your story has done something to light the flame. That brings you here this morning, ultimately. Somebody you might not know, it might have been a long, a long, long gone relative who prayed for you reg regularly. It might have been somebody who encouraged you when you were at a particularly vulnerable time and just was hospitable towards you, sat with you in your sad place. Hope is birthed in dark places, and that's what makes it hope. So, a couple of actions. Uh, firstly, I, I love this picture. Man in a prison cell, just uh, gazing out towards the light. A couple of actions. Read a psalm every day this week. Read, read one psalm every day. It will take you a minute per day. Is that worth doing? You say at this point, yes, Julian. Uh, you say at this point, yes, Julian. <laughs> um, I don't want to just talk to brains because we have to embody this stuff. We have to live it out. Otherwise, it's going to go... Right? So embody it. Live it this week. Read one psalm every day this week. And if you really feel sounds gone. Uh, if you really feel like you want to get a B plus, write some of it out in your own words. Take some of the images or some of the fra a phrase maybe even, and write it out as a prayer in your own words. Right in front of you. Let's uh, let's um, do something in the last few minutes. Not quite the same as last week. So just uh, uh, listen up. I think I've got re-instructions. Re Another great picture, isn't that? For those of you who feel like you're drowning. Okay. To the, um, the first column is a positive, happy, joyful column. But you may find that one of the uh, other columns to the right of that um, are what resonate the most with you. So... Start with the, the ones that are, are, are the top line. I'm not explaining this very well. Start with the top line and find one that you didn't write on last week, okay? You maybe wrote on anger last week. D don't do that. Do, you do one on loneliness or remorse or something like that. Choose one of those columns. Find some key words that echo for you, right? And write a prayer, a couple of sentences, three sentences, incorporating those words again, just like you did last week, okay? And then after that, after you've done that, take the column on the left, which is the happiness column, and try and resolve it a little bit. Now, what do I mean by resolving the prayer? It might be saying, um, if it was confusion, let's say you chose the column confusion. It might be saying, Lord, I'm still confused. You're not coming through. Um, and I remember a time when I was really content. I'm looking at the left column here. I uh, remember there was a time when I was really contented and gratified and keen in your presence and you were really close, but this still sucks. That's okay too. Or it might be a prayer of resolution, yet um, I will praise you and I will choose to walk down the happiness column a little bit, a little bit. So it might be uh, bringing to resolution, or it might be just kind of to resolve, to resolve to do something or be something. Or it might be that you're still shaking your fist madly at God, and you find that really hard to do cop the first column after that prayer. So let's get it work. Scribble down, um, and if you can, if you need, uh, uh, there's one or two uh, brochures. Uh, Jot is still available, not many, I think, but uh, start writing your prayer, um, and then you're positive. So.
So I should be writing your closing sentence now. So as you, as you reread that uh, prayer, you may think, oh, it's not, very, it's not a very clever prayer or it's not very theological. Um, don't beat yourself up with the, the rights and wrongs of whether you frame the prayer in a correct theologically good way. It's your prayer, it's your story, it's your dialogue with God. It's not for anybody else. Uh, to judge. It's not a black and white thing. So I'm just having a, a reminder. Um, this week I had a conversation with somebody to remi- uh, I was telling them about a certain child I know who is no longer a child. And they were asked by their teacher, uh, they, were, they were doing a, a, a thing in class about the correct use of water. And they were asked to draw a picture or to describe it. And this particular child <laughs> decided to show a little boy doing a wee. And the little boy was missing the urinal. And he put a big cross on that incorrect use of water. <laughs> and he put the correct one beside it, the correct picture beside it. Uh, it's not neat, black and white, right, wrong. You know, it's not that kind of thing that goes on with prayers. You see that in the psalmist, they let it hang out. It is the nature of conversation to not be neat and tidy and beautifully parsed English, P-A-R-S-E-D. So let's hold these prayers in our hands just now. I'm going to do a collective prayer for us as we hold these prayers in our hands. Lord, you've, you've read these words and they speak of our desire to reach from the heart upwards towards you, Lord. And yet you are already reaching down towards us in your love and your care, in our darkness, in our shadows, in our sense of drowning, in our difficulties. You are closer than we can possibly imagine. So we hold these prayers before you and say, Lord, would you bring some resolution, maybe a little bit, to these things that we pray, these situations that are on our minds and in our feelings. Lord, we hold up our our lives before you and say, Lord, have your way amongst us and maybe for one or two of us, Lord, you're going to do a big breakthrough in the coming days. But for many of us, it will simply be um, just keeping on walking with you. And so we cast our cares upon you because you care for us. We say we will not be anxious about anything but with prayer and supplication make our requests known to God and we do that this morning that your name might be glorified and that we might keep walking even if it involves challenges and difficulties in carrying a cross and all God's people said